Welcome, everyone. Uh, Dr. Vinay Bide here from Toronto. Very honored and excited to be able to speak to you for the next hour, hour and a little bit about a topic which I'm particularly passionate about, and that is being able to optimize root coverage outcomes in the anterior mandible. And as I'll hopefully impress upon you over the next hour or so, that this particular area is very unique, it's very special, and hence requires its own dedicated uh, presentation time. I hope that by the end of this lecture, you'll be having some answers, but I hope you also have some more questions so that we can have a nice uh, discussion after the fact. So sit back, relax, and uh, learn. Just a disclosure statement here. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I do not have any conflicts of interest, either financially or commercially. And everything that I show you today is validated in science and literature, and there's no reference to any investigational or off-label use of any product or material. And speaking of which, we're not going to be really talking about any uh, materials today per se. A little bit about myself. I work in a private practice, a group periodontal office, about 20 miles north of the greater Toronto area in the small little city of Aurora. And the best part about working in Aurora is that you're just far enough away from the riffraff, as I say, of the big city, but just close enough that you can go there easy, easily enough to enjoy all that the big city has to offer. The other thing is, as I mentioned to you, I work in a group periodontal office. And these are, these are the people that, that I work with. On the left, it's uh, a staff photo that was taken uh, somewhat recently. We like to get together as a group a couple of times a year. It's a good way to unwind outside of the office. And I'm really grateful for this group of individuals. This is my work family. And I probably spend more time with my work family than I do with my real family, considering that I'm working Monday to Friday. Uh, really, I'm blessed to have these people in my life, especially during... Uh, the pandemic when they really, really stepped it up a notch. And it's because of them that I'm able to do what I love to do on a daily basis at the level that I'm able to do it at. Uh, the picture on the right-hand side is a picture of all the periodontists that I work with. So there's five of us in this group. And the amazing thing is that uh, the two guys that are immediately to my right, um, Dr. Fias Jaffer and Dr. Jordan Bender, these two are my classmates in dental school. We then did a one-year hospital residency together, and then we were together as periodontal residents at the University of Toronto. So for eight years, we were together, and we just couldn't get enough of one another. Now we work together. So for the last 26 years, we've essentially been together. So it's pretty amazing the camaraderie that we have. The best part about working in a group periodontal office is that you're never alone, and we all have our strengths, our weaknesses, our likes, our dislikes, the stuff that we do really well and want to do more and more of, and other things that we're hesitant to dip our feet in the water with. And sometimes when I'm with a patient and I need a second set of eyes, just for a second opinion, just to validate what I'm thinking, I just pop my head into the op next door, ask my colleague, hey, can you come in and take a look? And it's really beautiful um, that way in that we learn from each other and uh, we always have a constant resource to draw experience from. When I'm not working in private practice, I teach part-time at the University of Toronto in the graduate periodontal uh, residency program, where I'm there every other Friday morning, and I'm primarily working with second and third year residents. And I'm also adjunct faculty at UPenn, and doing more of uh, virtual uh, education for, for them. But I love teaching because it allows me to, or rather forces me to stay on top of my information, and I learn as much from my residents, probably maybe more than than I teach them. So it's it's a great uh, back and forth uh, interaction and synergy, and uh, I think it really completes who I am um, as a clinician because I don't think I could work in private practice full time all the time. The three words that are really really central in my practice are success, predictability, and reproducibility. So success is, as we know when we obtain a particularly favorable result. But success might be once, it might be twice, it might be a hundred times. The more important metric really is what we call predictability. We always use this word in private practice, but what does predictability actually mean? So predictability is the ability to obtain a particular successful or favorable result a high percentage of the time. 
So when it comes to what we're going to talk about today, root coverage, I may be able to treat a gingival recession defect and get complete root coverage with a particular technique. But if I'm only able to do that once, then yes, it's successful, but that's it. It's one time. But if I'm able to replicate that result numerous times or a high proportion of times, then I can say that that particular technique is predictable. And this is what we're seeking in private practice. We're seeking predictability. We don't want to do things that are successful once, and then we just can't find that level of success again. We want to be able to look our patients in the eye and tell them that we can get a particular result for them a high percentage of time. The last thing is reproducibility. Oftentimes, we'll listen to lectures, we'll take courses, learn a particular technique or modality of treatment, come back to our offices, and try to replicate what the lecturer was talking to us about, only to come up shorthanded or not be able to get the same success or predictability that the lecturer had. One thing I'll tell you is that everything I show you today is reproducible. There's nothing that I'm going to show you that's heroic or that is magical with proper surgical training. Everything that I show you, you should be able to achieve as well. So that being said, the objectives for this next hour really are focused on the anterior mandible. We're going to evaluate the literature with respect to root coverage procedures in the anterior mandible. We'll discuss various treatment options specific to root coverage procedures in the anterior mandible. And we also want to understand why the anterior mandible is a bit of a different beast compared to other areas of the mouth. And in doing so, understanding the critical factors that will allow us to optimize our root coverage outcomes in this particular area. So just a broad overview of the epidemiology of gingival recession. We know that recession increases with age in the population. We've all heard the expression, getting long in the tooth. Well, that refers to gingival recession. We know that the proportion of people that have recession that are under the age of 50 or 60 is much lower than people that are above the age of 60, 65. And we know that recession affects everybody, whether you have high standards of oral hygiene or low standards of, or, of oral hygiene. We just know that the pattern of recession, depending on whether you have good oral hygiene or poor oral hygiene, may be a little bit different. We know from numerous studies, and most recently by Chamberoni and Tatakis, that sites which are untreated, despite having good oral hygiene, are more likely to progress than sites which are treated. We also know furthermore that sites which have been treated do remain stable over the long term. And interestingly enough, we know that mandibular incisors are the most frequently affected teeth when it comes to gingival recession. So when you look at this series of pictures, this is something that we see every single day in private practice, whether it's single recession, or multiple recessions, whether it's narrow, whether it's deep, whether it's wide, whether it's shallow, whether it's combination. This is something that I see in my private practice pretty much every single day. And it's a big part of my practice. And so we always have to know what we can offer our patients in terms of successful and predictable outcomes. And when I look at these pictures of recession, specifically in the anterior mandible, the one thing that most of these patients have in common is that they have a thin periodontal phenotype, which as, as we know is, is a risk factor for progressive recession. And the vast majority of these patients at some point in their life have had orthodontic treatment. Now, of course, we can't always predict orthodontically which teeth are going to be affected most by recession. Um, a lot of times we see this after the fact, despite the best intentions of the treating clinicians. But the reality is that if you were to ask these patients, have you had orthodontic treatment? Most of them would probably say yes. One study that's a really well done study by Renkema and colleagues uh, from 2013, uh, they did a retrospective case control study where they looked at the development of gingival recession for six years after orthodontic treatment was completed. Um, they had uh, controls. Uh, which uh, were obviously treat, uh, they had, they had non-treated controls, and then they had patients had an orthodontic treatment, and they had fairly decent sample size um, in both groups. And their primary outcome variable was the presence or development of buccal gingival recessions. And what they found was when they looked at all of the teeth, so 35% of teeth that were in patients in the treated group 
uh, developed recession over six years like during the retention period versus the untreated controls where only about 17% or maybe one out of every six patients developed recession. So there was a two to one ratio when they looked at all of the teeth taken together. When they looked at the mandibular incisors only, now remember there's um, 100 patients and 13%, so 13 teeth essentially, uh, there were 13 patients developed recessions compared to the untreated controls, which was only about 2%. There was an eightfold difference between untreated and treated. Now, when you look at these numbers, 35% of patients, um, regardless of where the teeth were, developed recessions, but 13% in the mandibular incisor re region, 13 out of 35 is almost one third. So this was the most affected group of teeth um, in this study period. And so they concluded that orthodontic treatment um, and or the retention phase may be risk factors and that the mandibular incisors were the most vulnerable group of teeth to be affected by gingival recession. So from the patient's side, when they come to you, typically they'll have aesthetic concerns, not so much in the anterior mandible, but you'd be surprised. A lot of patients are very well aware of the recessions that they have in the anterior mandible. And just because other people can't see them, it doesn't matter to them because they can see them. When they're brushing their teeth in the morning, they pull their lip down and they see this big recession defect. A lot of times these recession defects are accompanied by hypersensitivity of the exposed root surface. And a lot of patients will also come in noticing progression. Maybe they didn't notice it before and they're only noticing it now. So to them, it's rapid progression. But in some cases, patients are like, I never saw this before. And now all of a sudden I have this recession that's developed over the last four or five or six months. On the clinical side, what do we see? We see the non-carious cervical lesions, such as abrasion, erosion, subfractions, maybe even root caries. With increasing recession, we'll typically see an erosion of the zone of keratinized tissue, which will also predispose us to minimally attached gingiva. And this, furthermore, will increase the risk of the patient developing periodontal disease and attachment loss. And it's no coincidence that in some of these recession defects that are particularly isolated, you could have a patient with the cleanest mouth, but this area of recession may be the one that's almost impossible for them to clean, that's always inflamed always has plaque buildup despite their best efforts. So let's start off with a case which essentially is the reason why I'm giving you this lecture. This, this one case really was pivotal case for me in my learning and my evolution as a clinician. So this patient, when she presented to me a few years back, she at that time was in her late 40s. Uh, yes, she had orthodontic treatment, periodontally she was stable, medically she was ASA1, non-smoking, and she had this one recession defect on tooth number uh, 25, or in Canada, we say tooth number 41. The recession defect is about four millimeters, and you can get an appreciation that the tissues marginally at this recession defect are, are thin, there's a bit of a freedom there as well, and the patient also had some sensitivity. And so this is the problem list that we generated. We see gingival recession, obviously. We see the frenal proximity. The tissues are a bit on the thinner side. We see loss of interdental soft tissue, development of black triangles. Uh, the patient did come into me telling me that the recession was not like this from even six months back. And she, of course, had some sensitivity. Now, the one thing you may not be able to appreciate from this picture is that this tooth is just a smidge buccally oriented. So from the problem list, we can then come up with our diagnoses. And I diagnosed this as a Miller class three or RT2 recession. More and more, we're now tasked with using the Cairo classification, uh, which is RT1, RT2, RT3, but still a number of us use the Miller classification. And so every recession defect we'll be talking about today, I'll categorize using both classifications. We call this a Miller class three because by the definition of Miller class three, we see interdental loss of soft tissue, and clinically there is a little bit of malpositioning. RT2 recessions are very similar to Miller class threes in that we see interdental attachment loss, but it's still less than what we see on the buckle. Okay, so the CEJ in this case is exposed, but the attachment levels interproximally are still less 
than what we see buccally. And so this is an RT2 recession. And the patient has a thin gingival phenotype. So our treatment objectives become that we want to, number one, stop this recession from progressing. Not only do we want to stop this recession from progressing, we want to, as I tell my patients, reverse the recession, get root coverage. And by getting root coverage, we can then decrease or eliminate the sensitivity. And at the same time that we do a root coverage procedure, we can attempt to eliminate the influence of the freedom. We'll get rid of the freedom altogether. And then last but not least, not only do we want root coverage and all this other stuff that we talked about, but we also want to modify the phenotype, right? Make the gingival tissues thicker because we know that it's a good hedge against future progression. At the same time, we want to increase the zone of keratinized tissue as well. If we were to talk about what the surgical treatment options theoretically are for this particular defect, we could consider free gingival graft. We could consider a coronally advanced flap or even a laterally positioned flap. We could consider a connective tissue graft under a coronally advanced flap or a laterally positioned flap or even in a tunneling procedure. We could consider palatal substitutes like dermal or volume stable collagen matrices. And then we can also consider the use of a guided tissue regeneration or GTR approach with the use of various biologic agents. But if we look at the literature and in the last 15 years or so, uh, there have been numerous systematic reviews and meta-analyses looking at root coverage procedures in general, periodontal plastics procedures, et cetera. And you can see that uh, a number of them have had the same authors. Um, and the interesting thing is that really, whether you look at Chambron's paper in 2018 or Dai's paper in 2019 or Chambron's paper again in 2019, really not a whole lot has changed in what we typically see the conclusions, which is that for root coverage and phenotype modification, a coronally advanced flap and a subepithelial connective tissue graft are a gold standard. So then the treatment options really for this case, we already talked about what the theoretical surgical options are, but the, practically what can we do about a case like this? We can offer the patient the option of a subepithelial connective tissue graft, either with an envelope approach, a coronally advanced approach, flap approach, or a tunnel approach, or we could do a free gingival graft, also known as epithelialized palatal graft. Or based on the patient's fair oral hygiene, good oral hygiene, no treatment is always an option. Now, of course, that comes with the caveat that recession in and of itself will never spontaneously get better. If anything, over time, as we know from the works of Chambron and Tatakis, even in a mouth like this where the periodontal status is stable, that recession will likely progress, albeit slowly, over time. <clears throat> now, as residents, I can tell you that you guys are probably getting conflicted messages every single day, depending on which clinical instructor you work with. You know, certainly when I was a resident, I had the instructors which were quote unquote younger and more progressive. And then I had the older, more old school, uh, very fundamentally sound uh, instructors. And as residents, I found that we typically get lured by what's, for lack of a better word, sexy, right? So over the years, I've heard all these various statements. You know, I tunnel everything. I use dermal matrix everywhere. Who would want to use the patient's palatal tissue because it just causes them pain and discomfort? I never use vertical release incisions. Who does free gingival grafts anymore? They're, they're dinosaur procedure and they're totally unpredictable for root coverage. I only use autogenous tissue. Why would you use anything else? And I only do connective tissue grafts. These are all statements that I've heard over time. These are all statements that I'm sure a lot of you in attendance today are, are hearing as well. And it's kind of confusing in, in terms of what you do because we'll go to conferences, we'll hear prominent speakers talk about various things that make us really question, is what I'm doing okay? And it causes you to maybe momentarily change what you wanna do because you're some ways seduced by sort of the sexy side of, of dentistry. And I call this following the herd, right? And I'll talk to my colleagues and they'll say, hey, I, I only tunnel, okay? So after a while, all these things start playing 
uh, a huge influencing role in your mind and your in your professional life. And so for um, a case like this, where you know perhaps in the past I would have considered doing a free gingival graft, I thought, you know what, let's do a connective tissue graft, and that too, let's do it as a tunnel approach because. You know, I have been a bit slow on the uptake when it comes to tunneling, but all of my colleagues are doing it. So there's a bit of a, a peer pressure and herd mentality there. So this is what I did, a connective tissue graft and a tunnel approach. And then I saw the patient back at six months. And the only way that you guys can tell that this is actually a six-month post-op picture is the fact that there's still a little bit of the polypropylene suture embedded in the mucosa. Okay, from a root coverage perspective, I really didn't achieve much. And no matter how I look at it, no matter how many angles I look at this, this is essentially a non-result, okay? So when I put these two pictures, the preoperative and the postoperative at six months side by side, you can see that there is very little, if any, root coverage. It's not even worth trying to convince the patient that something positive was, was done for them. That same week, I saw a patient that I'd seen maybe six years earlier. And the patient came in to see me for a consultation regarding gingival recession in um, the posterior mandible. And I remembered this patient, he had a very, he had a very unique name and uh, you know, I have a thing for names, so I remembered this patient. And the one thing that I do that I'll tell everybody is in your career, at the very least, especially when it comes to mucogingival procedures or plastics procedures, take a preoperative picture for numerous reasons. Number one is it's great to document these cases for your own personal development. Maybe you'll be lecturing about your cases or even just from a medical legal perspective, it's nice to have this documentation. Because I remembered this guy's name and I knew that I had his preoperative pictures somewhere because I did this free gingival graft about six years ago. I went home that evening and was thumbing frenetically going through my external hard drives to find the preoperative picture for this gentleman. And I found it. And this is what his preoperative recession looked like. Okay. And you can see that he's lost tissue interproximally. He's got thin interproximal papilla. He's got wide recessions affecting both teeth number 24 and 25. He's got thin marginal tissues. He's got a prominent bulky frenum. He's got all these problems that for me, scream free gingival graft. We diagnosis as a Miller class three RT2 recession because it fits the criteria we spoke of earlier. And then this is how I positioned the graft. Now I want you to really carefully look at this. The graft is not even placed in a way that I'm even attempting to get any significant amount of root coverage, okay? I never saw the patient back after this. Patient never came for his post-operative visits. The only reason I saw him again was because he was referred to me for another area in his mouth. And so I was able to get that long-term follow-up to this free gingival graft. So we went from a situation where we placed the graft to maybe get 40 to 50% root coverage at best. And over six years, this graft has matured and has crept up such that we almost have complete root coverage. Complete root coverage, as we know, in a Miller class three or RT2 situation is not predictable. Maybe only 25% of the time, according to the RT classification, that you'll get complete root coverage in an RT2 situation. This is what we started with. And at six years, you could see the result that we obtained. Why is this? There's something called creeping attachment. Yes, creeping attachment is real. So, Read the study by Matter in 1980 that talks about five-year follow-ups. These graphs typically creep up in the first year, but slight creep even happens from years one to five. And I believe that this is probably what happened with my graph because there's no way that I positioned this graph as you saw in this position from the get-go. So this for me really was uh, a turning point. And you know, as a huge Star Wars fan, um, this look of Luke Skywalker when he finds out that Darth Vader is his father really summed up how I felt because for a long time, I was doing free gingival grafts in the anterior mandible and getting pretty decent results, but it was only because I was influenced by my colleagues to tunnel and connective tissue graft. 
that I abandoned this particular modality of treatment in favor of the more newer, shinier modality of treatment. And I was disappointed more than I was happy. And this last case that I showed you where I got that non-result really was a straw that broke the camel's back. It really made me reflect on you know, what exactly it was that I was doing. And then what really, really drove the nail in further was this regingival graft case. Now, just to add insult to injury, a couple of days later, I saw another patient um, who presented like this uh, for her um, three-year follow-up. And I'd done free gingival graft for her. Now, my apologies for the quality of this picture. Um, I took this on um, a lesser quality camera. I think it was maybe even taken on my cell phone. But it's still clear enough that you can see the extent and severity of the recessions, the thin tissues, minimally attached gingiva. And here's the CEJs to give you a better visualization of the recession defects. And at three years, this is what she looked like postoperatively. We have almost complete root coverage um, for the central incisors, but complete root coverage for the peripheral teeth. And you can see that we've got good thick phenotype conversion. We've got good zone of keratinized tissue. We've got vestibular depth now. And this graft isn't going anywhere. She'll never have to have this graft redone as long as she lives. Okay. But we know that a coronally advanced flap and a connective tissue graft is the gold standard for root coverage and phenotype modification. So where am I, what am I missing here? Because it doesn't seem to work for me as well in the anterior mandible as it does perhaps in other areas of the mouth. So I asked myself the question, you know, is a connective tissue graft really the unequivocal gold standard for root coverage procedures? And as I did a deep dive into the literature, I started to realize that the data that we have is really heavily skewed or in favor of maxillary incisors, canines, and premolars. And that there's actually very little data specifically talking about root coverage procedures and outcomes in the mandibular anterior region, and that too specifically mandibular incisors. In fact, this paper by Tatakis and colleagues as a part of a regeneration workshop by the Academy back in 2015, um, where they actually looked at the evidence and what they found was that the majority of the evidence was in fact for single rooted teeth having gingival recession, maxillary canines, and, uh, and even premolar teeth to some degree. Most of the studies looked at Miller class one, Miller class two defects, nowadays we'd say RT1. And the evidence on site-specific factors is very limited, right? You can't paint every area of the mouth with the same brush, okay? So all the conversations and the dialogues that we have with our patients regarding root coverage outcomes are essentially based on data, which is heavily proportioned and skewed towards maxillary anterior, okay? And maxillary anterior is a very forgiving area in the mouth. Let me think about it, right? It, it's an it's a immobile jaw. There's really no muscle pull. We've got good quality of tissue most of the time. We've got good vestibular depth. Pretty much anything you do will have reasonable chance of success and predictability in the anterior maxilla. And in fact, recent articles, one by Zucchelli and colleagues, where they looked at the influence of tooth location on coronally advanced lap procedures uh, for root coverage, what they did was they categorized which teeth were having coronally advanced flap procedures. They looked at 18 articles that spanned about 400 localized gingival recessions treated just with a coronally advanced flap. So no connective tissue, just a coronally advanced flap. And what they found was when they did their distribution of teeth according to location, the vast majority of teeth that were treated were in the canine and first premolar areas, accounting for more than 50% of the teeth that were treated, compared to mandibular central and lateral incisors, which is only about 17 or 18%. So almost a threefold difference between the mandibular incisors and the canine and premolars in the maxilla. Okay, so of course our data is going to reflect mostly what it's represented by, which is canines and premolars. When Zucchelli and colleagues looked at something similar, but now looking at multiple adjacent gingival recessions, um, 
treated with coronally advanced flap or connective tissue graft, what they found was even, even more alarming. And that when you look at the lower anterior, okay, the, the, the mandibular anterior sextant, it had the lowest mean root coverage um, with the coronally advanced flap alone and the lowest percentage of complete root coverage. With the connective tissue graft, the, the uh, root coverage increased somewhat, but the predictability or the complete root coverage uh, percentage was almost lowest compared to in the maxilla. So what is so unique about the anterior mandible that it's a bit of a, a different area, so to speak? Well, there's a higher proportion of malpositioned teeth. We know that the bone is thin and most likely dehissed. We also know that we've got this thing here called the mentalis muscle, which is uh, quite prominent. We also have shallow vestibules, oftentimes thin marginal tissues, and gravity is not working for us in, in this area. So, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, another Star Wars reference, there was a procedure called the free gingival graft. Now, this was one of the earliest methods of augmentation. Um, but the primary use of this was for submarginal um, purposes, where we we're just looking to increase the width of keratinized tissue. So there's a submarginal or marginal technique. It wasn't really a root coverage procedure. It consisted of an epithelialized palatal graft. And so just to take you through a quick example of this, here's a patient that has Miller class 3 or RT3 uh, recession, where we're not really going for root coverage here, as it's not really amenable. But we want to increase the vestibular depth and the zone of keratinized tissue. So we start off by making a submarginal incision, prepare our recipient bed, take a graft from the palate and secure it in place nicely at that mucogingival junction or where the mucogingival junction used to be. We suture the palate, we treat the palate, get hemostasis. And then we see at one year, we have a nice thick zone of keratinized tissue. We've increased the vestibular depth. There's been no root coverage obtained, but that wasn't the primary objective of this procedure to begin with. And this is one of the most predictable procedures in not only just periodontics, but in all of dentistry. Here's an example of the marginal technique, marginal incision technique. So this patient came in with class three Miller and RT2 Cairo. So we make our incision more or less at the gingival margin. We're again, not really aiming for root coverage here. We take our graft from the palate, we stitch it in place appropriately, both uh, peripherally and then compression sutures for vertical for horizontal adaptation. And we can see that at one year, we've got increased zone of keratinized tissue, increased vestibular depth, and this graft is really not going anywhere. And if anything, it's going to help prolong the life of these teeth. And here you go again. But it wasn't until Sullivan and Atkins in 1968, and then of course, Preston Miller, where free gingival grafts were considered seriously for obtaining root coverage. So going back to our favorite case here, the one that really changed uh, a lot of things for me, what are we gonna do? So I thought, okay, I've already tried to connect the tissue graft once with a tunnel. I'm not gonna try it again. I'm going to go back to what I thought would work for me in the first place, which would be a free gingival graft. So we prepared our recipient bed, harvested our graft, secured our graft in place nicely. And, and you can see here that I've only used chromic gut sutures, which is in most cases very sufficient. And at six months, we can see that we've been able to get partial root coverage and we can see a clear increase in tissue thickness. We've eliminated the frenal pull and we have an increase in the zone of keratinized tissue. And at one year, we see continued uh, creep up of this graft, such that even from six months to one year, we can appreciate that slight amount of creep. And when I look at the three and a half year follow-up, we almost have complete root coverage. We weren't per se expecting complete root coverage given that this is a um, RT2 recession, but I think that this is about as good as a result as we could probably expect in a defect like this. And it's stable. It's not going anywhere. The patient will never have to have this redone for as long as she lives. So let me take you through free gingival graft procedure step by step. So here's a patient that 
as a Miller class one RT1 recession. Miller class one because we've got full fill of the interdental spaces and RT1 because the CEJ is not visible. We only have attachment loss effectively on the buccal aspect. We have thin uh, marginal tissues. In fact, we have no attached gingiva and we have this frenal pull that we can see here as well. Again, some lateral views to give you an appreciation of why this tooth may have recession in the first place. We can see from the occlusal view that despite the orthodontic treatment, uh, the buccal root is still a bit more prominent to the buccal predisposing this to recession. And we can also see the plaque build up here as well. So we always start with gentle scaling and root planing to remove any root surface prominences. And we then demarcate the recipient site. I typically like to make a nice rectangular box. I start my incisions about three millimeters away from the CEJ and come straight across, make two vertical release incisions, and then gently do a split thickness dissection, after which point I will get rid of this buccal tissue. So we have a nice recipient bed here. The other thing I want you to appreciate is the hidden recession that you see here as well. And this is important because remember, all this area here is avascular. So making a nice big recipient site preparation will allow the graft that we place to draw upon all this nice blood supply so that whatever is sitting of the graft on this avascular root surface will still be nourished and hopefully won't die back or slough. So we have five millimeters of hidden recession. We also have about three millimeters, two and a half millimeters of, uh, of recession. That's uh, the, the width of recession. So now I'm taking my measurements for how big of a graft I want to take. We're gonna outline the area for, for donor tissue harvest on the palate to match our dimensions. We then gently dissect the epithelialized palatal graft from the palate. And we're aiming for a graft that's about one and a half to two millimeters thick. We are gonna get some shrinkage, so we wanna compensate for that by having uh, a graft, we wanna err on the side of thickness. We can't get primary closure over the palate and palatal wound management is important. So I typically will place a couple of sutures to hold things nicely in tension, put gauze pressure, and I've started using these vitamin E polymeric dressings on the palate as well, which encourage healing, also help to some degree with hemostasis. We then take our graft, secure it to the recipient site. I use 5-0 monocryl sutures, mostly now, peripherally. You can also use chromic gut sutures as well. The, the monocryl just maybe looks better in pictures, um, easier to see. And then I do these cross-mattress periosteally anchored compression sutures so that the graft can be horizontally adapted to the recipient site. The graft has to be in intimate contact with the recipient site. So we essentially make these cross mattress sutures or you can put them parallel. The important thing is that they're just gently compressing the graft against the recipient site. And this is an occlusal view of what it looks like to take that bite of the periosteum. The knots are tied to the buckle, slightly apical to the graft. And so here we go, the graft is secure. We do our mobility test by moving the patient's lip to make sure that it's not uh, going anywhere. And at one week, we can see that this is what a typical free gingival graft looks like. It always looks a bit war-torn, as uh, one of my colleagues says, but if you just have enough patience, you'll see that over time, that graft will mature. It has to go through the various healing phases, such as the plasmatic circulation and capillary proliferation. And by day four or five, the graft will be adapted to the recipient site. And typically, I tell my patients, we'll know within a week, week and a half, whether this graft has taken or not. So at this point, as long as you're not seeing stark white, you're okay. And then by three weeks, we can see that the graft has started to mature nicely. We've got mature epithelium probably with the reedy pegs and, and keratin histologically. But we know now that we've been able to get complete root coverage. The graft looks healthy. At this point, we'll remove the sutures and I'll call the patients back at three months where we see nice graft maturation here with complete root coverage. And the blending of the tissue is actually pretty decent as well which has been one of the biggest criticisms for free gingival grafts. But in the anterior mandible, where it's not typically an aesthetic zone, doesn't mean we shouldn't try and be aesthetic, but it's not necessarily always the primary goal. In order to have a better blend, I found this paper that was written by Cordellini and colleagues just over a decade ago, where 
what they do is they deepithelialize the portion that's apical to the mucogingival junction. Deepithelialize the portion of the free gingival graft with the hope that the blending of the graft will be better. Now, when I look at the clinical photos, I'm not sure that it makes a huge difference, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Now here's a case, uh, what about multiple adjacent gingival recessions? This patient came in, young lady, 26 years old at the time that I saw her, post-orthodontic treatment, and you can see that she's got some substantial recessions, thinning of the gum tissues, um, malpositioning of teeth to some degree where you see buccal prominences of the lateral and the canine. And this was diagnosed as a Miller class three RT2 recession. So complete root coverage may not be as predictable. And when we look at the lateral view, we can really appreciate the lack of vestibular depth here and even the severity of the recession. So in a case like this, my options are I could do a connective tissue graft or I could do a free gingival graft. But what are my objectives in a case like this? My objectives are I want to change the phenotype. I want to obtain root coverage to the extent possible. I want to establish uh, a proper vestibular depth. And the one procedure that allows me to do that in one shot without worry is a free gingival graft. So we, we prepared the recipient site and once I saw the extent of the buccal root prominences, I started to get a bit worried here because now not only are these teeth outside of the envelope of bone, this is definitely going to affect how much root coverage I can get with my free gingival graft. I had to go to both sides of the palate to harvest a sufficiently large graft to be able to secure in place. We then performed what's called the graft anastomosis where we take these two harvests and suture them together using monocryl sutures to create one long piece of graft tissue and then secure this whole singular piece of graft to the recipient site. And you can appreciate the thickness of this graft. Now, the other thing that I'll mention is that the area where we sutured these graft pieces together, if this area sits on the root surface, it's going to slough. So always make sure that the area where the graft is attached, which is the weakest point of the graft, is on the recipient bed, not on the root surface. Okay, so we can see that we've really, really secured this graft in place nicely. And at one year, we can see nice, thick zone of keratinized tissue, partial root coverage, increased in the vestibular um, depth, as well as removal of the influence of the freedom. The patient is also happier because now she feels like she's not gonna lose her teeth, but we can see that we still have recessions at uh, teeth number 22 and 23 that uh, are more substantial than the rest. But that's not surprising given the fact that those teeth had the most buccal prominences. When we look at the lateral views, we can really, we can really appreciate again, the increase in vestibular depth, the, the phenotype modification. And yes, we didn't achieve the root coverage that maybe we wanted to achieve, but we solved the problems of the vestibular depth, the quality of tissues, the freedom pull. And when we look at the preoperative and one-year postoperative side by side, we can really appreciate that even though we didn't get a ton of root coverage, we probably got better than we thought we did. And now all we need to do is if the patient really wants root coverage, we can do a coronally advanced flap, uh, particularly for the 22 and the 23, as described by Bernie Moulin in the mid-70s. But that's really elective. That's really up to the patient. Um, if she wants to do it, I'll be happy to do it for her. At this point, she's just happy that uh, she's not noticing progression and her sensitivity is much reduced. And so I'll be following up with her on an annual basis uh, to see if we get further creeping attachment. So when I think about what the criteria are for successful root coverage using free gingival grafts, you know, typically you want a patient that's healthy and non smoking. Remember, you're only relying on one area, one source of blood supply for free gingival graft. Blood supply is typically compromised in smokers. And so if we're already compromised um, and we're relying on one single source of blood supply, that typically does not um, lead to the most favorable outcomes. We want to diagnose the defect and set realistic expectations for our patients. So know your Miller diagnosis or your uh, chiro classification um, so that you can tell the patient that we have reasonable chance of getting root coverage, whether we can cover most, if not all of the root surface, or whether we're gonna do a gum graft just to improve the thickness of the gum tissue. We're not so much focused on the root coverage. Thickness of graft matters. If it's too thin, it's going to slough. If it's too thick, it just may be big and bulky. Um, so ideally, like 1.5 to two millimeters is a good thickness. We want to prepare our site adequately. 
right? We don't have the same forgiveness with the free gingival graft that we do with other procedures that may have uh, more blood supply inherently. So we want to draw from the periphery. And that's why with my free gingival grafts, I'll actually make my recipient sites a little bit larger uh, because I want to draw from that adjacent uh, tissue for blood supply. We want to have a graft that is not mobile. Careful suturing, very, very important, intimate adaptation of the graft. And the interdental papilla dimension does matter. Now, there's been no formal studies on this, but I remember a lecture from Preston Miller, Dr. Miller, many years ago when I was a resident, where he said that where the interdental papilla dimension is at least three millimeters or greater, that is the area that you could typically expect root coverage to. So I've been using that as a, as a rough guide um, for the length of my career so far, and it's actually been pretty accurate. In fact, I've been analyzing patients from my own practice uh, with the hopes of uh, hopefully publishing this uh, work one day where I have minimum of six months of follow-up. And so far I have 50 consecutively treated patients. They're all young, healthy, non-smoking. And the mean initial recession depth was about three millimeters. Um, I stratified them into overall RT1, RT2 classification. And what I found was that for my RT2 class, RT1 classification recessions, um, the percent of sites that I've been able to obtain complete root coverage for with free genital grafts is almost 73%, let's say three quarters of the recession defects. And with RT2, it's just over a quarter of the recession defects. And this is very interesting because it actually compares very well to the Cairo classification in, in the data that they presented in their paper from 2011, where our, their RT1 defects, typically they were able to get 74% of the sites with complete root coverage. And for an RT2 a defect, maybe only 24% of the time, they'd be able to get a complete root coverage. Interestingly, the RT uh, classification, the data that they used to devise their classification, it did not consist at all of results obtained from free gingival grafts. It was all coronally advanced flap or pedicle grafts with, a connect with or without a connective tissue. So the fact that this classification can also, by virtue of what I've been able to see in my, in my practice, validate what you can see with the free gingival graft, it's pretty powerful in that sense. And it actually validates the Miller classification to some degree as well, because the Miller classification was essentially all based on free gingival grafts. So the biggest knock against free gingival grafts for root coverage is that they typically can have insufficient blood supply. We're relying solely on that underlying periosteum bone uh, for the blood supply. And because we're having one source of blood supply, there's a reasonable chance that the graft may not take. And this definitely decreases, theoretically, the predict predictability. Now, I put predictability with a question mark because I actually don't agree with that. I think if you do your grafts in a, in a particular way to respect the fact that you, you want to have good blood supply uh, with sufficient recipient site preparation, then we can have various, uh, very, very good predictability as I've shown you with my own private practice data. Aesthetically, um, they're definitely not the same as connected tissue graphs. They, they do have a, a tire patch-like appearance. Um, and again, going back to the, the blood supply, we're relying on this periosteum for the blood supply to nourish this graft. And sometimes we just don't get that nourishment and we end up with a result like this, where on, on one tooth, the graft took, um, and on the one that we were trying to get root coverage for, it didn't take as well. And then, of course, there's uh, post-operative considerations, such as uh, bleeding from the palate, uh, pain from the palate while it's healing. But these are all very manageable, and we can treat these with a co-pack or some type of a dressing or a palatal stent. So in a case like this, even, so what do you do? if if you don't get the result that you want the first time. Well, in this case, I just did another free gingival graft uh, because I thought maybe it was just bad luck the first time that it didn't work out. And lo and behold, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again, the graft ended up working up the second time. And this is what it looks like from pre-op to the initial failure to the eventual success at six months. Post-operatively, as I mentioned, you've got this palatal wound that is susceptible to bleeding. Also, patients are not uh, exactly happy when they come back uh, for their uh, one week or two week follow up. But you can mitigate the pain and discomfort by using surgical dressings like that vitamin E polymeric dressing that I talked about, even Copac. And over the last year, year and a half, we've been taking impressions 
and making essentially vacuform stents uh, for a patient, which has been a game changer in my practice. So now let's talk about free gentle graft versus connective tissue grafts, right? I mean, one of the things that happened was that while Miller's classification came out in, in 1985, it was around that same time that Langer and Langer came out with their article on connective tissue grafting. And connective tissue grafting made a lot of sense for many reasons in that we have bilaminar blood supply, we can increase the zone of keratinized tissue, we um, have better aesthetics. And so that particular modality of treatment was more in favor uh, than, let's say, free gingival grafts. And free gingival grafts were really relegated to those areas where aesthetics weren't a concern or we only wanted to increase the zone of keratinized tissue. When you look at the literature, there really isn't any head-to-head -head studies beyond these two that I'm going to talk to you about looking at free gingival graft versus connective tissue grafts. This study by Janke uh, looked at 10 patients uh, where they had where each where they had nine who completed the study, so they only had nine defects. They uh, had contralateral uh, paired defects where they treated one site with a free gentle graft and one site with a connective tissue graft, and they looked at a six-month follow-up. And of course, they found that the mean root coverage was much higher with a connective tissue graft versus a free gentle graft, and that they had complete root coverage in about 55% of CTG patients. CTG sites and only about 11% of free gingival graft sites. And they concluded that connective tissue grafts provide better root coverage, but that both procedures resulted in increased keratinized tissue and improved attachment levels. But when you look at the data, what's interesting is that in the teeth that were treated with free gingival grafts, three out of the nine were in the mandibular anterior. And oddly enough, the root coverage for all of these teeth was on average better than for the non mandibular anterior treated teeth. Whereas in the connective tissue graft treated teeth, there's only one tooth from the anterior mandible. Uh, and everything else was either from other areas or, or even the uh, uh, anterior maxilla. The other study by Paul Antonio in, in the late 90s, um, they looked at more patients. They did a five-year study and they concluded that mean root coverage, again, was much higher in connective tissue graft sites versus free gingival graft treated sites. And then predictability when they look at complete root coverage is that almost 50% of the sites with connective tissue grafts had complete root coverage and only about 10% with free gingival grafts had complete root coverage, which is in line with the, with the study by Jankin and colleagues that I just showed you. So their conclusion was of course the same in that the connective tissue graft was superior to the free gingival graft root coverage, but that again, both procedures increase the zone of keratinized tissue uh, very similarly. There's no statistically significant differences between them. Interestingly, um, there really wasn't a whole lot of data given in this paper in terms of uh, the teeth that were treated, the distribution, et cetera, but they posted, uh, they, 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 they published a, a couple of images of areas that were treated with connective tissue grafts and pre gingival grafts. And what's interesting is that in the representative picture for connective tissue graft, they treated a maxillary canine and for the free gingival graft, they treated mandibular anterior. So again, this is uh, very telling of, of how data can be uh, somewhat skewed, manipulated to, to portray um, a certain outcome or result. Now, I didn't mean for this to be uh, a free gingival graft lovin' or, or, or love fest. Um, I really want to show you my evolution as a clinician and that how we're able to adapt our thinking and evolve as clinicians to really improve the outcomes for our patients. Yes, it's easy for me to say I can do a free gingival graft for most cases in the anterior mandible, um, and I don't have to think about it. But you know, in, in an attempt to always be better, to try and squeeze out that extra percentage or two of root coverage, we have to be willing to go a little bit outside of our comfort zone. And you know, what about connective tissue grafts root coverage in the anterior mandible? There really isn't a whole lot of literature that looking that looks specifically at connective tissue grafts for treating recessions in the anterior mandible. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but from 2005 to 2019, there's only maybe 10 papers that looked at it. And some of them were well-controlled studies. Others were maybe case series and case reports. And there is a variety of procedures. They're very heterogeneous um, in, in, their, in their approach. So even to try and do this uh, as a systematic review or meta-analysis, I think would be complicated and wouldn't be um, really valuable in terms of what we'd get as a result. 
Uh, the four studies that you see on the left that are highlighted, I'll, I'll go into some detail with, uh, because these studies have really changed the way that I think about mandibular anterior, uh, particularly incisor recessions. So one of the first ones was by Randall Harris back in the 90s, where he had three groups of patients where he had one group that was treated with a Crohnly advanced flap with a connective tissue graft, one where he treated with um, a double papilla with a connective tissue graft, and then one group where he did a laterally um, a lateral tunnel approach with a connective tissue graft. It was only a three-month study, and the recessions were all three millimeters or greater. And uh, what he found was that for recessions that were maybe more moderate, ones that were three millimeters or greater, the uh, double papilla tunnel, um, the, the double papilla or the tunnel um, group with the connective tissue graft were superior than a coronally advanced flap with connective tissue. Okay, and they concluded that when you have recession defects that are three millimeters or greater, consider the double papilla approach or a tunnel with a lateral closure in conjunction with a connective tissue graft. And so I just want to take you through a double papilla case. This was shared with me by my good friend, Dr. John Kim, periodontist in North Carolina. So this is typically used for a case where you've got an isolated recession that's, that's somewhat deep, and you've got good thickness of tissue peripherally. So what we do is we essentially... Uh, prepare our recipient site by making these oblique uh, vertical incisions, do a split thickness dissection such that we can bring those two pedicles essentially together, place our connective tissue graft underneath, and then coronally advance this double papilla entity that we've sutured together. And the result is quite good. We didn't get complete root coverage, but close to it, and we've gotten good keratinized tissue here as well. So this is the double papilla with connective tissue graft approach. And here's one of my cases where I did uh, with a two and a half year follow-up where we did the same thing that I showed you in the case uh, previously, and we have complete root coverage there. Uh, Zucchelli, of course, has been the champion of the vertically advanced flap for mandibular interior. And unlike a coronally advanced flap, the difference here is that he removes the submucosal layer. And by doing so, takes away tension uh, from the vest, uh, uh, tension from, uh, from the muscles, also is able to increase the vestibular depth. And that's why he calls it the vertically advanced flap, not just the coronally advanced flap. And his results from his paper are, are quite outstanding. We can see from the lateral views uh, that there is very shallow vestibule here. Now we've got a vestibule thickness of the tissue and complete root coverage. So again, he's shown in numerous publications that this is a very predictable uh, procedure. And then last but not least, uh, a more newer procedure, which was um, published by Anton Skoulian and Pat Allen um, just about five years ago, is the laterally closed tunnel approach for uh, narrow isolated recessions in the anterior mandible. Now, this is very similar to the double papilla procedure that I showed you, except here you're not actually elevating anything. You're leaving the tissues completely intact. What you're doing is you're tunneling peripherally to try and get enough release that you can get both edges of the peripheral tissue together. We then take a connective tissue graft and place it in the tunnel, secure it laterally with anchoring sutures, and then coronally we, we tie our knot off at the back on the lingual, and then we bring the edges of the, of the lateral tissues together. And here's a case that I'm going to show you that I've done. Um, with, uh, with great results. Uh, start off with scaling and root planing, and then we take our ore band knife and I slowly start to undermine all around um, that recession defect peripherally from the mesial distal aspects and apically as well. I then harvest my connective tissue from the palate, and I, I prefer a de-epithelialized approach that I learned from Professor Zucchelli. Um, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to get a nice uniform piece of tissue. You just have to be careful about removing all the epithelium, which once you do this a number of times, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I then place the graft in the tunnel and you can see that I've secured it laterally. And then what you can't see, maybe if you look closely enough, is that there's uh, a sling suture to hold the graft in place coronally as well. I then bring the edges of the buccal tissues together I'm using 5 monocryl stitches here. And at two years, we can see 
almost an obscene amount of boot coverage and tissue thickness, which is evident even just from the buccal view. From the lateral view, we can see that phenotype modification. We can see from the occlusal view even the thickness of, of gum tissue there as well. And when we look at the pre-op and the, and the two-year follow-up side by side, uh, we can really appreciate the root coverage that we've been able to obtain. Another follow-up uh, of two years that I have uh, for this uh, for another patient. This patient was an 80-year-old lady that uh, had this isolated recession. She'd had a free gingival graft by her previous periodontist, where uh, we got some good thickening of the lateral tissue, uh, but we still have um, thin tissues apically. We did a coronally advanced, or we did the, the laterally closed tunnel, the LCT, and considering that this tooth is malpositioned. Um, an RT2 recession, the amount of root coverage that we obtained, I think, is pretty uh, acceptable. Um, the last approach is uh, something that's somewhat of a hybrid approach, a uh, paper by Stimmelmeyer and colleagues in 2011 that uh, uh, was also one of the co-authors featuring Pat Allen. Um, here, this is like taking um, a hybrid graph where we have a connective tissue with an epithelial island. Um, there's no coronal advancement, actually, so we get minimal postoperative retraction. And I'll take you through a case to show you. So here's the case with an isolated recession. It's a Miller class one RT1 recession where we can see this prominent freedom. We can see uh, about three to four millimeters of recession. And I thought that this would be a, a good case for the hybrid approach. We prepare our tunnel. This is very, very key for this procedure. Prepare our tunnel sufficiently. We then harvest the graft from the palate where we leave an epithelial island, which conforms pretty precisely to the area of exposed root surface. We then place our graft into the tunnel and secure the tunnel and hold everything in place nicely. Now remember, there's been no attempt really made to coronally advance. At one week, we can see what's interesting is um, this area of necrosis, which is very similar to what we see with free gingival graft healing. And that was the part of uh, the graft that was somewhat exposed. But by three weeks, things are looking more normal and healthier. We've got complete root coverage. And at one year, we can see nice, healthy tissues, very aesthetic results. And, you know, a lot of people will hide behind doing unesthetic work in the anterior mandible because it's, quote unquote, not an aesthetic zone. I think that we should try and aim for aesthetic work, regardless of whether people see it or not. The patient sees it and they're happy with it. And as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a huge win. Preoperative, postoperative, one year, we can see the huge difference we've been able to make. We've addressed all of the patient's chief complaints of progression, sensitivity, um, not being able to clean that area properly, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we talked about the double pillar. We talked about the laterally closed tunnel. We talked about the epithelial island approach. What do all these techniques have in common? And this, for me, really was a bit of a light bulb moment. But what all these techniques have in common in the anterior mandible is that they don't disturb the vestibule. If anything, they try to enhance the vestibule. So this is the reason why a coronally advanced flap with a connective tissue graft is probably the least predictable and successful modality of treatment for root coverage in the anterior mandible, because it will try to move the vestibule up and the vestibule always wants to reestablish itself. And the muscle pull in the anterior mandible will also preclude us from having a stable result over the long term. So any technique that doesn't disturb the, the vestibule actually gives you a fighting chance of successful and predictable result. So the moral of the story is if you don't respect the vestibule, it will not respect you. So where am I at now? In this case here, where we have thin tissues, high freedom pull, previously done free gingival graft in the past, where we're really just trying to clean house, I'll do a free gingival graft. In a case like this, where I've got thin inflamed marginal tissues, recession maybe three to four millimeters, I'd consider a free gingival graft and maybe a coronally advanced flap if need be, or I'd consider the epithelial island approach, or perhaps even a vertically advanced flap approach a la Zucchelli and colleagues. And in isolated recessions that are narrow and deep, uh, we could either consider a double papilla or we can consider a laterally closed tunnel. And wherever possible, I will go with a laterally closed tunnel approach because it's easier, there's less involved, and it just preserves the blood supply that much more. So 
In conclusion, I hope I've been able to show you that root coverage for the anterior mandible can be both successful and predictable, and that the freegenable graft still should be considered a viable option for root coverage and phenotype conversion. Of course, the parameters of the FGG are different than the CTG. The CTG is perhaps more forgiving, but freegenable graft, if you respect the biology, I think you can get some outstanding results. The vertically advanced flap, the laterally closed tunnel, epithelial island, they're all great site-specific approaches because they do not disturb the vestibule or the mucogingival junction. And that, my friends, I believe really is the key to root coverage in the anterior mandible, is to maintain the patency and the sanctity of the vestibule. And with that being said, thank you all very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules. I hope you learned a few things today. I hope you have more questions that we can now discuss after this, after this lecture. If you have any questions, please uh, connect with me by email uh, or even on social media where I'm pretty active. You can scan this, uh, uh, this QR code and uh, that'll take you to my page. Thank you again. And now I look forward to uh, seeing you on the other side.